I will let you know. Click and go live. <laughs> All right. Alrighty, great stuff. Um, hi there, YouTube. <laughs> and hello to all the wonderful QGIS um, supporters and the community in general. Um, welcome to our next session. Um, in this session, Kevin is going to take us through some really cool stuff on remote sensing of um, vegetation, and that is in the Philippi horticultural area. And I will then hand over to you, Kevin, to take us through. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, my name is Kevin Musungu. I am the head of program for geomatics at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town. Um, we are part of the civil engineering and surveying department, and our interest is really in using um, GIS for mapping um, from satellite images. So with this particular case study, we used quantum GIS to semi-automatically extract um, vegetation from satellite photographs, as you'll see as I go through the presentation. All right. So let me begin by introducing the case study area. It is, I'll call it the PHA, but it is the Philippi horticultural area, and it's a very unique part of Cape Town. Um, it produces more than 48 vegetable types, so there's lots of farming going on in that area, including herbs and flowers, and 50% of the fresh produce that we consume in Cape Town comes from this PHA area, so it's very, very important. Um, we estimate that it produces between 1,000 and 2,000 jobs, some of them part-time and many of them full-time. And the unique thing about the PHA, the two of them, one is that it's actually located in the suburbs of Cape Town. So it's quite easy to see um, lots of highways around the PHA and built up areas. And secondly, it's located in the Cape, Farm, in the Cape Aquifer, which is a huge water source for the Cape Town area as well. So it's a very important area with a long history, uh, more than 100 years of farming in that space. Just to show you where we are located. So this is within Cape Town and you can see the PHA is that um, sort of pan shape, you know, of within this uh, map of the whole Cape Town area. And the red outline just indicates the, the Philippi horticultural area. But the green line, which is the urban edge, shows areas outside this area that have now been um, urbanized. So this middle part here is really currently the most um, viable portion for farming, or most utilized currently for farming purposes. This is also an aerial photograph of the PHA with uh, the mountains in the background. So you can see on the periphery how urbanized it has become, but also with lots of farms um, and dams in the area. So it's a beautiful place to visit, uh, lots of fresh air but also increasing urbanization, unfortunately. And that's really the core of what we wanted to look at. So this just shows you aerial um, satellite images from Landsat, um, which is freely available from um, the USGS in America. So this just shows false color images done um, within our GIS package with quantum GIS. And in the false color image, what we do is instead of making a map um, that appears with natural colors, we've tried to highlight features using false colors. So in this case, we know that vegetation reflects high amounts of near infrared, even more than green. And so we've chosen to use the red color to show the reflectance of near infrared in this uh, area in 1990 and in 2015. And what you're looking at is the bright red is the healthiest vegetation. The darker red would be natural growing uh, vegetation like bushes over rocks. And then on the right hand image, what is blue, greenish on my screen is what is happening now with urban growth. So that's really um, built up area within the PHA. So you'll see in 1990, there was a lot more agricultural activity. And in 2015, you can see that there's been increased um, urbanization over 
that period of time. So over 25 years, there has been significant growth um, in urban land cover within the PHA, which is very concerning because like I mentioned, this is the area that is meant uh, exclusively for farming and it allows us to access food and vegetables and fruits, flowers, etc. Um, within this space because it is located over an aquifer. So it's not prone to flat to droughts and that sort of thing. So this is just this just these, these two maps just highlight the extent of the problem. But what our aims were in this study, we wanted firstly to map um, the urban land cover and the vegetation cover using machine learning algorithms. And then we wanted to quantify those land cover changes. So wanted to know where have there been changes and what these changes are. So um, what has changed to what? For instance, um, do we have areas that were previously covered by water that have been reclaimed for urban growth? That kind of question was what we sought to answer. And one of our first steps was to derive an index. This is done using the raster calculator in quantum GIS. And based on this, we're able to subtract, um, to look at the near infrared uh, band in the spectrum and the red band in the spectrum, because we know that plants reflect high amounts of near infrared and green, that's why they appear green, although our naked eyes can't see the near infrared. And they absorb the red um, bands or red color from the or satellite images, sorry, from, from the sun. So by leveraging that, uh, taking the near infrared minus the red, but by the near infrared plus the red, we're able to highlight areas of, of healthy vegetation. So if you look at that map in 1990, the dark green and the light green shows the vegetation and from the orange towards the dark red shows less vegetation. Uh, highly, high, it's normally an indicator of urban or hard you know, land cover on the earth's surface. And in 2015, we see that in August, when we took this image, there were far less farms actually being cultivated. So you have very little near um, um, ref, um, results in terms of the vegetation index. So the gain, the dark green and the light green shows the healthiest vegetation. And then the, all the yellow towards the red, orange shows less vegetation or unhealthy vegetation or whatever land cover actually isn't covered by vegetation. So you can see that the trend is actually quite worrisome because there is, at that point, there was less um, agricultural activity and increased urban growth. We then um, automated the classification of this using a random forest classification. And what essentially happens is we begin by digitizing a couple of samples within our, our area, our land cover scene. And this is um, done by say, uh, creating a shape file and you just pick up um, patches or polygons of water of urban land cover, vegetation, and bare ground, depending on the classes we sought to pick up. And based on that, we're able to train a machine learning algorithm. In this case, we use a random forest. And the random forest uh, uses decision trees to group these pixels into their various classes. So by giving the samples of with the polygons, the software is able to detect or come up with a statistical average of what reflectance values water has and what different values urban areas have, and then search through the other pixels in the image and then allocate those pixels to the appropriate class. So you'll see in 1990, um, that's the land cover type, we had water in some areas. The unclassified is standard, but in this case, everything has been classified. We had uh, vegetation, as we've seen, from the other images, and we had bare ground. And in this case, we're actually able to distinguish the bare ground from the urban land cover. And then in 2015, what we then see is we have, um, again, urban land cover, and that has significantly increased. 
we have bare grounds, right? And then we still have vegetation, ongoing activity, and water. So this gives a better accuracy in terms of the mapping compared to the indices we had before on the previous slide. So then we began to quantify what the changes are per class to see what has really changed over time. And we found that the urban class increased from 14.4% to 25%. So that's a significant amount of growth, uh, just shy of double in urban growth, which we can also see actually from our maps. And then we had vegetation cover that also, so then the water increased from 1.7% to 9.2% in that area. So it's probably just after um, the winter rains that we were able to, to get these satellite images. The vegetation cover decreased from 37.9 to 26%, okay, which is, again, we could see because there's a reduction in farming activity and the bare ground increased. So both urban class and bare ground increased. And normally the bare ground could be um, indicative of harvesting or preparation for urbanization. And then we noted the largest changes were from the vegetation to the urban. And again, vegetation to bare soil. Although in some areas, interestingly, there was also bare soil that was actually farmed um, compared to the previous states. And then lastly, from bare soil, which is actually converted to urban, which means that they actually constructed um, urban structures on the bare ground. So what we were able to conclude from this is that based on our maps, we're able to see uh, that, um, sorry about that, that the previous, that areas on the western boundary of Philippi, which were previously uncultivated, have now, so were previously cultivated, have now actually been cultivated. Thank you. Thank you for your audience. I apologize for my phone ringing. <laughs> um, thank you for listening to our presentation. What's next? What needs to happen next? So just one second. Sorry about that. Um, currently, what we yeah. <laughs> Currently what we are doing um, is we're now using NanoSat to see if we can improve the quality of our mapping because they, they operate at a three meter resolution. So we should be able to map with far more accuracy. Thank you very much. Brilliant stuff. That's really, really fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. I did just want to ask um, about, are you, uh, sort of habitual user of QGIS to use it often and what has been your experience using it for this specific application? All right. I am, we, as a department, we made the switch to QGIS um, about five years ago. So we teach exclusively using quantum GIS for our GIS classes and for our remote sensing classes. And QGIS has come a very long way since we began to use it. You know, with, with each update, with the increase in the plugins, we have found that more and more it's becoming user-friendly. And right now, I would say that it's the best open source um, environment that we can use for our remote sensing classes. To put it in context, the algorithms that we have used, we, we used four algorithms for this study. Although I only showed you the results for the one you know, in the interest of time. And those four algorithms, I normally you'd ha have had to use um, if, if you were to purchase software, it would have cost you quite an arm and a leg just to run that. So we have found that over time, we began by using um, one plugin, and then there'll be more plugins built on the first plugin. And it's a fantastic resource because it's freely available to our students and they can work remotely from wherever they are, like we saw last year with the COVID, in order to utilize these plugins and software. So we do use QGIS quite a lot, quite a lot. All right, brilliant stuff. So from our live chat, um, Victoria asks, um, what were the accuracies and accuracy metrics of the land cover maps? Oh yes, thank you. So I didn't put that in the results, I should have. Um, we for the for the random forests 
we had about 94% accuracy overall and about a 0.91 kappa hat index for that. So we achieved quite a lot with it. And also when training the classifier, we um, had about a 95% accuracy. I should have put in the spreadsheet, I wish I had for that to show that. So there's actually a very good performance on it. What we noted though, in the method we used with most random forest classifiers, what happens is people test a number of trees to see, to find the optimum number of trees that can use for the classification. In this case, when we use the Zaka, we use the cross folds um, method so that it would automatically pick up the ideal number of trees to be used. So it was a different approach and it's one we intend to publish on. Brilliant stuff. Alrighty, then another question that's come through, also same from Victoria. Um, she asks, what tool was used to get the land cover change percentages from the two land cover classifications? Okay, so the percentages we did, we used the semi-automated classification. What we did is we did a, a raster subtraction. So it was um, taking the new date minus the old date. But we also um, did, because we had a pixel to pixel comparison over the changes, were, and we knew which class was which, we were able to, set, to, to distinguish within from every pixel which class had changed to another particular class. So instead of just having a subtraction between them, we went a step further, and this can be seen in the semi-automated classification plugin, where you can see between any two classes on the comparison, between any two images, what the changes are. So um, within QGIS, I would recommend that she checks the semi-automated classification plugin, and the particular module, um, I can't recall what it's called exactly, but I think it is, it might be, no, I can't recall exactly what it is, but it's one of those post-classification um, tools mm -hmm. that we used. Great. I could open That's it actually, enough time and I can, I, can, I can show it to you. Yeah. Um, right. We do have another question coming in from um, Gravel Homer. And okay. They'd like to know, just in the meantime, while you're um, going through, um, yes. they'd like to know, do you have an automated method, i.e. a model to run this specific analysis, but in a different area? We can, because we developed the model, um, a model separately using the, the Taka plugin, right? Mm. And we had a lot of samples we used. So you can use it in another area. Of course, the risk is, depending on the distance um, from our study area, that the accuracy will diminish. And, and also depending on the type of plants that are actually within the other scene compared to um, our current scene in the PHA, again, that might affect the accuracy, but of course, Having trained the model and assuming similarity in environments like an urban, you know, urban vegetation and water, etc., it should be replicable in in another area. And the model is automatically extracted when you run um, the training of the of the classifier. All right, all right, fantastic. There's just one other um, comment here um, from someone called John Neary, and okay. he says, Kevin. Thanks for a very interesting presentation, which um, he will be reviewing. <laughs> okay, cool. And um, we actually have our initial paper. If one is to Google um, my, my surname, Musungu, and PDP Horticultural Area, they're able to see our first paper that we did. Uh, in that paper, it's actually a published um, peer-reviewed paper, and it's also a book chapter they will see that although in that case study we use a different classifier, it has maximum likelihood. This one follows on on that one, but he can see the first um, results from our previous study. That's brilliant. I'm literally oh. Googling it right now so that I can put it into the comments and people can click through immediately to it. Cool. And I was hoping to buy enough time to um, for this to open. <laughs> <in QGIS. laughs> 
<laughs> Hopefully you can see my, can you still see my screen? Yeah, yes I can. Okay, I'll cancel that. Uh, okay. And of course QGIS, this is another study we're doing now um, based on the fires in Cape Town. But I'll show you the SCP and the post-processing. There it is, that's the tool. The land cover change um, under the SCP. And so there you'll have your first date um, classification, the second date, and when you run that, it should show you which class changed from one particular uh, land cover type to the next one. That's the one we used. All right, fantastic. So, um, Victoria, <laughs> who is watching, that's um, the tool that was used. Very, yes. very cool. All right, so um, John Neary is back and he just asks if the presentation slides will be distributed for reference. Um, Kevin, are you happy to do that? Are you happy to send them to me and for me to put them out? Just yeah, that's fine, no problem. That's oh, that'd okay. be great. That'd be awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, I just wanted to ask sort of a wider impact question because, you know, QGIS is so close to a lot of our hearts and we're all kind of QGIS nerds here. <laughs> and yes. I do think, you know, the adoption of QGIS is is really applicable in South Africa's context. You know, I'm up in Joburg and you're down in the Cape and, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic technology. So I think, you know, your work particularly um, is really promoting the use of QGIS, but also do you think it'll have more applications in terms of maybe food security or the adoption of this kind of analysis in South Africa and in Africa in the greater context? Oh, that's a heavy question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, um, we hope so, definitely, because as a department, our research is has been focused um, a lot on on um, our local, you know, uh, problems like alien alien clearing and and this sort of thing, fires and vegetation, and we often try to present our work in environments like uh, where people of authority, like municipalities, are. So we do have a GIS um, association here, and and normally we want to present it to such places. I must say though that. Um, I have had interest from municipal, you know, officer, officials who would like to view, to read this sort of, of, of feedback, you know, because the city has taken a stance with the PHA that they are trying to control the urban growth, sorry, the urbanization in that area, you know, especially the urban sprawl because there's a lot of, of informal settlements, you know, in that area as well. There have been some, some, the city has made some adjustments to the original way it meant to it was meant to be to be utilized. So they have allowed now in the latest policies for some level of urbanization, mainly to the to the west of the PHA. But we hope that these kind of studies eventually um, do get some traction. I, I have seen previously on our studies with flooding, we have actually managed to help communities themselves to see their the the what is happening in the areas in terms of the floods from a spatial perspective as well as the the local council officials as well so it's the, the potential is there um, but of course that is also a political matter so there are a number of of things that could limit um, the success of it mm, absolutely absolutely I'm just checking if there are any other questions in our live chat I know there are a couple of um, Rasta um, enthusiasts <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. in the audience. So right. I'm just, you know, letting for some time for any other questions. Um, I did just want to ask, obviously, I don't have a fantastic background in um, vegetation mapping, a, a little bit, a little bit. So yeah. um, you did mention that the, if you were transferring to a different area, obviously the signature of the specific plants would be different. So yes. how did you, or, or how were you able to look at the specific signature of the plants in, in your area, or, um, you know, the, the light signature? And from that, would you be able to tell what kind of plants they are? Because, I mean, I'm think, I'm an invasion biologist um, back yes. way back okay. when. So in terms <laughs> of invasion, that would be really useful. 
Yes, great. So currently, so initially, when we began um, this research in the PHA, I, I took an interest in the PHA because I used to drive past and I noticed, I'm a land surveyor as well, uh, my background. So I noticed increased, you know, activity in terms of construction and people asking about the PHA. So that's, that's where our interest began. And um, so we began to look at what we could see from the satellites. And, and initially we began with Landsat, which is rather coarse at 30 meters. But currently, our current ongoing studies, um, because we have students working through this for the next six months, we're now using Planet, Planet Labs, which is three meter resolution. And that has a much higher resolution. And, and based on fields, you know, gathered data, we can then begin to look at actual planting activity. So we can begin to distinguish, um, say, trees, you know, from, from vegetables and that kind of thing uh, being planted in that area. So that is where we intend to go. So initially, we're just testing the, the, the possibilities of what we could do with the remote sensing, but we intend to go further, and we are working on that now, um, by testing, first of all, the potential of a number of machine learning classifiers, which we have already achieved, and then we're now going to test the potential by combining both of this data, high resolution, three meter resolution, and the municipal LIDAR data to see if we're able to pick up now, distinguish which type of you know, trees from, from vegetables in the area, and in the future also the types of vegetables being grown um, in that area. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so you know, later on, we could have a look at maybe bugweed or something that really is invading there. You could pick yes. that up. I think that that as a as a as a tool would be fantastically useful, not just in the you know agricultural sector, but in invasion biology in all sorts. Um, we yes. do have another question from Victoria. Thanks, Victoria. Um, okay. And she would like to know what was the source for the ground truth and validation of the data. And did you use the same digitized data for both years? Okay, good question. No. So the source was we overlaid area photography um, and we only searched. So we didn't do any ground truthing on this. Everything was done based satellite imagery, um, area of photography, and Google Earth, okay, which in itself is quite high resolution. Uh, for, what, for what we are covering, but if we intend to do plant species, of course, we must go onto the ground. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of the samples, what we did is we couldn't use the same um, samples across the two years because we're looking for changes. So we worried that if we had used uh, the same samples, we would confuse the classifier because if let's say we sampled an area with bare, with bare ground and then we use the same sample later on, for um and now it's it's, it's and it has now suddenly been uh, farmed that would be a problem so we we did separate we did separate samples across the two dates however from the samples we split them you know on an 80 20 split and when we when we did the classification and when we did the validation on the actual um accuracy assessment of the classifiers all righty Fantastic. Yeah. Um, just for everyone who is watching and in the comments, I have popped a um, link there to um, Kevin's research gate, which is, if you don't know, kind of like Facebook for academics. It's really cool. Um, and you can see his paper and everything from there. And I'm sure other links to his work. Um, so please link through to there. All right. <laughs> and um, we don't have any other questions right now. So I will then start rounding us off for this session. Um, it just hey. leaves me to say, you know, thank you so much, Kevin, for giving it. It's fascinating to see what's going on. And it's great to see, you know, um, this kind of level of QGIS and spatial analysis and GIS going on um, yes. in the area. I think I think it's it's very very cool, and I will be having a look at your paper soon. <laughs> yes, um, to have to have a good look at it, and um, thank you so much for giving us this fantastic presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. I have put my I added my email address there in case anyone has you know any queries via email. Um, I don't know if I have enough time to summarize what else we are doing. Then yeah, please, please go through. 
Okay, cool. So um, we are looking at um, a couple of things. Uh, I've talked about the Philippi, the PHA. One of the other things we are looking at um, is alien, um, alien trees. So we, we, we in, in many areas in this, you know, we, we have fine boss. So fine boss is unique to the, to the Cape, but it often suffers, you know, from, from fires. It's often prone to fires. And mm -hmm. what we're finding, what we're finding is that quite often after the fire, there are alien trees that grow, you know, mainly Port Jackson, for instance. So one of our studies is to look at um, the growth, you know, of alien trees in these fine boss um, areas. We're also looking at the efficiency of of initiatives that they've taken to kill these alien trees. So there've been efforts to spray some of these trees, but whether or not they are thriving after that or dying, et cetera, that also we're trying to monitor using this nanosat data. And of course, these same machine learning technologies in, in quantum GIS. The other thing we're looking at is the use of UAV data for plant health, uh, mainly in vineyards. So we have been, um, asked to look at some vineyards here in Cape, in the in Wellington area where there are plants that are suffering from some diseases and we have done UAV flights and so we're trying to see how well we can classify and model some of those um, diseases within those vineyards. And lastly, we're looking in town at the District 6 area Again, we have captured UAV data and we intend to see what we can pick up from the high, high raised data. We want to pick up in the areas where there was uh, forced removal to see if we can uh, pick up some of the ruins from that UAV data and whether or not we can develop indices for that. So that's really where we are going um, for 2021. Right. So, if anyone has um, case studies they want researched, that is what we do <laughs> for free. Brilliant. So Brilliant. just email us and we can work out a way to use our research to 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 solve the problem. Cool. That is so yeah. great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that you're having a look at some of the alien species. And I yeah. think looking at vineyard diseases is very topical um, and useful for farmers. I think, you know, economically, with yeah. um, wine and viticulture being so important in the Cape area, that's a fantastic bit of research to be doing. And yes. I think it's very interesting to see in the District 6 area, you know, historically what kind of um, effect that the forced removals did have. And you having a look at that, I think is very, very interesting. Um, if any of our overseas um, viewers would like to have a look, there's a fantastic um, book called District 6 that you can understand really a lot more about what happened in um, that time. So do have a look and I think it'd be really fascinating to see what the outcome of your research this year is going to be. Yeah, thank you very much. Awesome. Um, we just have a couple of comments, just thanking you so much for an awesome presentation. And I will then um, end us off. Thank you so much for um, joining us, everyone. Our next session in the QGIS Open Day will be later this evening. Well, it'll be at seven this evening for me. Um, so we're trying to catch a little bit of the American audience. Um, so please do check out the next session of the QGIS Open Day. And that just leaves me to thank Kevin again. And um, please do join in. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.